this is part of uh, Port Academy Talk Club. Uh, it started in June 2nd and it's uh, going until July 19. Uh, I'm Romulo Barato. I'm the managing editor at Art Daily Brazil. And I'm one of the interviewers of this series together with uh, my friend Paulini Personeni, uh, in charge of the editorial development at Actar Publishers and its digital platform um, Urban Next. Uh, so most of you already know uh, that Port Academy is a platform for lectures, uh, visiting to important architecture sites, classes, exhibitions, and also publications. Uh, since uh, its first uh, edition, uh, more than 2,000 participants from uh, almost 90 nationalities have uh, took part, uh, have taken part to the to the to this platform. Uh, and uh, regarding the, the guests, uh, more than 150 guests has already uh, taken part uh, in the Port Academy uh, from uh, 30 different nationalities. So it's a truly a worldwide platform. Uh, the Academy proposes a brief but powerful cultural and educational experience in dialogue uh, with globally relevant uh, practitioners, architects, uh, uh, theoricians uh, and urbanists. Uh, one quote from the website, I think uh, uh, it's interesting to start with it. Uh, we admire the figures that dream about architecture uh, and that's why uh, our guest today is Matteo Guidoni from Italy. Welcome, uh, Matteo. Uh, it's, Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to introduce uh, Make a short introduction of, of yourself and Saluto Bono, your office, uh, to the audience. Uh, but then we can uh, talk more uh, later. So for those who already uh, doesn't know, Saluto Bono is a uh, Milan-based architecture practice uh, run by Matteo. It was founded by himself in 2005. Uh, Saluto Bono and, and, uh, and Matteo has served as editor of the Instructions and Manuals uh, section of uh, Abitari magazine, uh, the renowned uh, Italian magazine from 2007 to 2010, uh, and also as a creative director of Domus magazine in 2011 and uh, 12. Uh, the office has participated uh, in the ben Venice Biennale in several editions, 2008, 12, and 14, uh, and also designed the Italian pavilion in the 2010s edition. Uh, besides that, Saluto Bono has published uh, two interesting publications. First one, Manual of Decolonization for 2010, and uh, Fundamental Acts from 2016. Uh, besides that, Matteo Guidoni uh, was the founding partner of the research agency Multiplicity and worked with them in 2002 to 2006, uh, being guest professor in several institutions, uh, for instance, Instituto Universitario di Arquitetura di Venezia, the Politecnico di Milano, the Royal Danish Academy of Arts in Copenhagen, uh, and also the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Bogota, Colombia, here in South America. Uh, besides that, he has given so, uh, lectures in several schools uh, and institutes like the Berlage Institute, Berkeley School in the U.S. and Columbia University. Uh, uh, besides that, uh, Mateo is also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of San Rocco, an independent international publication about architecture. It's uh, quite an extensive uh, resume. Uh, <laughs> My really <own>. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Mateo, thanks again for, for being part of the, of the talk club from Port Academy. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, this afternoon. It's almost uh, evening uh, in, in Italy already. Uh, so, maybe we can uh, start uh, with you talking about uh, yourself firstly and your previous experience before Saluto Buono, what do you think? Yes, um, well difficult to understand, to, to decide where to start from, but um, I will start 
saying that I, I really uh, I am excited to be part of the Porto Academy this year and uh, uh, I would like to thank you for this invitation and for, for this occasion uh, to talk. Um, yes, as you, as you have said, uh, if we want to talk about uh, the era before Salto Buono, I have to mention, um, of course, the, let's say my formation as an architect in the Instituto Universitario di Architettura di Venezia, in the UA, um, which uh, by chance I can say it had a quite a strong connection with, uh, uh, with the um, Portuguese panorama of architecture in the years uh, when I studied, uh, saying that were the early 90s, um, between the early 90s and the late 90s. Um, and then um, one very important experience for me was uh, the participation in this research group called Multiplicity um, that was somehow activated by Stefano Boeri and then uh, was, uh, let's say, uh, involved in a wide uh, network of researchers uh, in very different disciplines. And this, this experience is so crucial in my my, let's say, path, uh, because um, I learned a lot about how to produce uh, research on the city, how, um, how to, let's say, connect uh, architecture, uh, which is, um, as you correctly say, something that I uh, always dream of and, uh, and, and, and try to practice, uh, to connect it with the urban environment and with uh, what happens uh, in the city and in the um, urbanized uh, uh, territory in general. Um, and I have always, like, uh, for me, this, this kind of connection is very important. It's part of the tradition also of uh, uh, Italian architecture since, I would say, the 60s, but even before. And, and it's really something I, I, I try to consider and keep in mind and uh, uh, and connect with all the time I approach a new, a new project. Um, yeah, then after a few years of research with Multiplicity that basically taught me about um, how, to, how to produce research through case studies, uh, like let's say trying to formulate a, a wider hypothesis and then try to verify it in, uh, in very specific contexts. Um, uh, and also, I learn how to how to produce um, modes of um, let's say um, of uh, how to how to tell about the result of this research. How to produce let's say a system of of vision of perception of uh, uh, immersion. Uh, that uh, com not only communicates but uh, tries to convey uh, with different means, uh, uh, with different media, um, the results of the research. Then the experience with Salotto Buono, um, uh, that was, uh, let's say, my, my first uh, attempt to establish an office of architecture, and since the beginning was very diverse, the activity of Salotto Buono because we were involved in uh, editorial projects. You have mentioned Abitare or Dombos Magazine and so on. And, and for us, these experiences were, again, um, the opportunity to produce research on architecture through, uh, specifically through the medium of uh, drawing. Uh, we worked a lot on architectural drawing as a tool to, to, to deconstruct, to understand the projects, to communicate them. But it's not only about communication, it's almost a way to uh, take someone else's project and, and make it your own, or try to communicate how to make it your own, you know, and not just observe it passively, but uh, try to make something out of it. Um, yeah. And then recently we, uh, I mean, since few years, I, I would say that uh, my activity is more and more focused on uh, architectural projects um, of various scales uh, that ranges from temporary pavilions and installations to 
more consistent buildings, uh, more permanent buildings. And at the moment, in particular, I am working a lot with uh, public administrations. So I am working on public projects here in Italy, especially. And this is a great challenge uh, and, and, and the great opportunity, I, I think, because it makes a lot of sense to me to work on, on various ideas of public space. Uh, it's also difficult given the, the real condition, uh, the operative conditions uh, in this country, like in many other countries, you know, in terms of budgets, timing, uh, bureaucracy, and oh. so forth. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty much a, a, an impressive overview. You you touch it in several points that I would like to to go a bit uh, deeper uh, uh, here. Uh, first, uh, let's go back to the urban scale uh, and specifically the the relation of your works uh, with the public spaces, because uh, when you when you say when you talk about uh, the the city, the urban scale. Uh, you're actually talking uh, mostly about the, the public spaces uh, and how your architecture deals with it with a very strong verb coming from art. Uh, in, your, in the Instagram of Saluto Bono, uh, it's uh, highlighted there, art, uh, mm -hmm. not architecture. Uh, I couldn't so, find architecture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the options. It's quite quite uh, intriguing because... Uh, we can see this kind of uh, merge or, uh, you know, all these three fields are so uh, well related uh, in, your, in your work. So I want you to talk a bit about the relationship between art, architecture and, uh, and public spaces. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, very interesting question. Um, uh, first of all, I, I should say that I consider every architecture, all architecture, inherently public. Uh, in a sense that even when you construct a building like a private house, uh, you are inevitably doing something public that will affect the public environment. And, uh, and so this is the, in my opinion, the, the unavoidable public nature of architecture. Um, to be more specific, the projects I'm dealing with at the moment are um, done in, in for public administrations. There are commissions for public administrations and that makes them properly public in a sense that there is also a public procedure, a public, yeah, uh, uh, all, all this stuff. Um, but when I, um, I, I had the occasion recently to, to work, um, to produce temporary projects for uh, specific festivals around, around Europe or around the world. And, and that gave me the occasion of producing a series of experiments on possibilities on public space. Um, and the possibility also, I would say, of uh, producing something monumental or with the attitude of a monument, but with very little means, with a very little, limited budget uh, with a uh, very limited uh, uh, time span, as I was saying. Um, and, and that was really a very important lesson that I am trying to take now into um, the realm of, uh, of more, um, let's say, permanent uh, projects. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, when you, when you do this kind of projects, you are operating in a scale which is something in between the scale model and the one-to-one. -one. Uh, it's, it's a sort of experiment, it's a sort of uh, um, simulation you know, that lasts for a few weeks, maybe a few months, um, and you can observe and, uh, and, and try to produce your conclusions, your observations. Um, one aspect that I am really concerned about in, in let's say, talking about the public sphere is the importance that we still have in being physically present in a space together, you know? being there. Um, for instance, in a few years ago, I designed this project, the Teatrino, that was meant to be a, a space for, uh, for the interviews, for the interviews in the framework of uh, a festival about architecture that was taking place here in Milan. And the Teatrino was in front of the Triennale building. 
And, and my main question there was, what, what is the meaning today of uh, uh, going uh, somewhere in a specific place to attend an interview? What, is, what, is the, what, what does make the interview so, um, what is the special relationship between the interviewer, interviewee, audience, and so on, that you cannot experience when you are just uh, uh, being interviewed. Yeah, for instance, in this, in this mode, yes, you know? Right. Interesting as well, <laughs> of course, but if we had the public physically present totally, around totally us, different. it would be a completely different thing. Um, and what is interesting is that uh, the, the name, the, the word interview puts a lot of importance on the visual relationship. No? Inter interview, uh, entrevoir in French, you know, yes. is looking at each other closely. So now we are not close, we are looking at each other in this mediated way, but uh, when you are uh, together in this sort of uh, intellectual bath, which is um, the, the interview, uh, there is something particular happening in terms of space, in terms of visual relationship and so on, that I, am, that I tried to explore with that with that project. There's this uh, ludic uh, nature in this, uh, uh, you know, in this uh, Teatrino. Uh, yeah. Like you said, a, a monument, but also very ludic. Uh, found it really interesting. But one thing that caught my attention in this uh, 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 project designed to be, you know, to stay there for like a defined period of time is, uh, and recalling something that you said uh, at the beginning, uh, it has to do with uh, experiment, experimenting research in, in, in the real world, you know, uh, practicing research uh, yes. and, and having the opportunity to learn from it with uh, an experiment that is uh, temporary, which brings another, uh, which brings the, the fourth dimension of architecture even, uh, you know, even closer, because uh, it not simply deals with uh, the, the time of the, the inhabitants there, but it has a, a defined time where it's not gonna exist anymore. Uh, so yeah, I, I want you to talk a, a, a little bit about this, uh, how these uh, case studies, uh, they, they inform your research again for the next project. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because there is always a feedback, um, let's say, from research to the project and, and also back to the research. For instance, you, you do a project, then you write about it. Um, now, as architects, when, when we write, now uh, we write articles on magazines or different kinds of publications, we, we are always very shy uh, in talking about our projects, you know, as if you yes. are, uh, let's say, you can be accused of uh, megalomany or something like this. Um, on, on the contrary, I consider that uh, research and practice go together in, in, in creating your, your, let's say, path of research. And uh, once you have done a project, you can write about it. Uh, after writing, you can make another project on the basis of reflection that you have done. Uh, or you can, for instance, in my case, there were projects that were abandoned. And I tried to make something out of them, just uh, producing a text, producing a wider, um, frame that uh, included these projects and, uh, and, and you can still use them no? and you can transform them into part of your, uh, uh, your archive, let's say, together with other projects that are not yours. I really believe in this uh, kind of interconnection between your projects, projects of others, projects that uh, you relate to in, uh, in time, in history. If we think about it, um, Andrea Palladio wrote the books of architecture, including Roman architecture and his own project without any problem, no, mixing them. And, uh, um, and I think that uh, this kind of attitude towards presenting your work as uh, uh, part of a wider knowledge 
which is architecture that can be shareable and communicable and uh, let's say and can become the um, part of the knowledge of somebody else is not uh, uh, practiced anymore so much uh, it disappeared somehow with modernity and uh, i uh, I, I really believe it's, uh, it's, it's a treasure that we have to rediscover. Absolutely. Uh, going on in this uh, and, uh, and bringing back uh, and uh, taking one of the topics that you mentioned uh, before, uh, the architectural drawing, uh, no, looking at your website and your uh, Instagram account, uh, it's really, you know, uh, flagrant, uh, your interest in architectural representation. Uh, and my hunch is that uh, it's, uh, it's not simply a representation. It, it's treated like architecture itself, possibly because the, the physical artifact uh, most of the times were already uh, dismantled, is not there. So what remains, the document, uh, is, is still part of architecture. And, and communi communicating that is uh, uh, via uh, drawings or publications, uh, drawings published in, in, in magazines or uh, this kind of, uh, of a vehicle. Uh, it's where architecture uh, remains alive somehow. So, yeah, I wanted to talk, for you to talk about, about your interest in, in uh, the, the representation of architecture and also uh, uh, your work in editing and publishing in, you know, in several magazines, uh, Abitale, Domus, uh, you know, San Rocco. Yes. Uh, yeah, this really opens a world of uh, consideration. I will try to, uh, to be concise. Um, Yes, I think that uh, in the experience of each of us, the number of architectures that we actually visit and, uh, and have a direct contact with is maybe 100 of, uh, of the architect architectures that we know. You know. Most of the architectures that we know is, is just uh, through uh, it's mediated through a magazine, through a publication, through Instagram, and so on. And uh, we have to accept this, and we have to understand that, uh, um, yes, most of the time, uh, even the, the, in, in exhibitions, architecture is a, is a by, I mean, what is presented in the exhibition is a byproduct of, uh, of what is uh, the actual architecture that uh, uh, we talk about. Uh, so, I am really interested in architectural representation, but as you correctly said, I, I, I subscribe on this, uh, let's say, thought, is uh, it's not only about representation, maybe it's not at all about representation. I, since a few years, I am, I mean, I'm giving classes uh, titled Beyond Representation, and uh, in, my, in my opinion, uh, the real question is always the matter of uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, representation makes, uh, uh, a possible, makes, makes possible a manipulation and an appropriation of uh, what you are communicating. So, for instance, um, when we present beautiful images of our projects, they can be really appealing, they can convince clients and so on, and this is architectural representation but you cannot do anything else with them. Uh, I mean, someone cannot really uh, rework them and, uh, and make something else and appropriate them and manipulate them. Um, while I, we work a lot on, on the, we can, we can call it precise drawing, a drawing which is measurable, uh, which is uh, plan, section, axonometric, and so on and so forth because we really wanted to provide an exact um, set of information and at the same time something that is open to, to, be, to be reworked. And in this sense goes really beyond representation, is not passive anymore, becomes something uh, activate or activable. And, uh, and that's uh, my, let's say, the, ma the main interest that I, interesting I have um, towards this uh, field. 
um, dealing with architectural publications, uh, you also, when we were doing San Rocco, we, um, we tried to, to think a lot about the specific of each form of representation of the project. So a text is one thing, photography is another thing, uh, the, the drawing is another thing again, and each one of these uh, media has, uh, a, let's say, a, a specific uh, which has to be explored. Um, sometimes we found them mix, mixed in publications, but uh, uh, we, we really try to, uh, to explore, to, to try to um, obtain the maximum possibility of, uh, of each of them. Yeah. So uh, in working also with other magazines uh, before, uh, especially with commercial magazines, made us critical about, uh, about the panorama of publication of architecture. And, uh, and with San Rocco, we tried somehow to, to respond to this uh, uh, sense, of, uh, sense of luck that we have, a luck in the sense of uh, missing something, missing the opportunity to establish um, um, a debate. Uh, that once again, you establish a debate when you have uh, uh, something that you can work on, that you can manipulate, that you can make your own and you can contradict. And uh, yeah, so we, with San Rocco, we want to establish a, a, a platform of collaboration and at the same time, a platform of uh, debate and discussion that could be open outside of the boundaries of our country. Interesting. I found it really beautiful when you said that uh, the, drawing, the, the drawings that you make at Salotto Bono, uh, they, they have the, the mission to remain, uh, to stay open uh, and not uh, you know, enclosed in themselves. Uh, it's really interesting. You know, it's a, a drawing as a tool, not uh, just to represent something, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, its function is to remain uh, open to, uh, available to adaptation uh, from other people, uh, not only from yourself, uh, to other ideas uh, and to keep evolving. It's, it's a, a different way to think about uh, drawings and, and images in architecture. Uh, yes, exactly. Not only not only drawings, sorry, um, not only drawings, but images in general. Uh, yes. In this moment, for instance, I am trying to collaborate with uh, with photographers um, and trying to uh, let's say understand their point of view on projects that uh, we have done. Uh, and, and this is really, again, it's, it's a sort of dialogue that uh, uh, produces unexpected results because I, I mean, I don't want to present the project as I expected to be presented, but I am somehow open to, um, to, to interpretation. And in, if we want to put it in more general terms, this has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, the generosity that I am trying to, to, to find in architecture all the time. Uh, and for generosity, I mean the, the fact that uh, once architecture is built, then the way people will use it is unpredictable and uh, most of the time is different from what we expect and we have to be aware of it. And if our project is able to absorb this, uh, uh, these um, unpredictable uses, then it's, I think it's a generous project. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's closed in itself and it becomes a sort of self-referential icon. I completely agree with that. Uh, so, Matteo, we are uh, almost running out of time. Uh, so, but okay. to wrap up, I would like to ask you if you can uh, give us some clues about what you're going to talk about in your participation in Porto Academy this year. Can you? Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> nice. uh, we, we, at least we have a title. The title is uh, La Conduta. 
la conduta. La, con, la conduta refers, of course, to the, the conduta of Quinta da Malaguera in, uh, by Sisa in Evora. And uh, it's this wonderful infrastructure exhibited, uh, let's say, uh, spanning above the, the houses and uh, in, in the words of Alvaro Sisa, establishing another scale which is the scale of, uh, of the monument, it's the scale of uh, the public space. Yes. Um, we know, I mean, this conduta can be justified in many ways, no? Uh, we can say it's uh, cheaper or easier to put the infrastructure in the sky and not under, in the ground. But after all, he uh, clearly stated that the main aim was to establish another scale. Um, for me, I was always fascinated with this project and was always intrigued and I didn't fully understand it I, until I visited it uh, only last year. And, um, and I think the, the Conduta is something that teaches us a lot. First of all, that we are not considering infrastructures anymore as architects. As, as architects, most of the time we leave this issue to to other figures, and, yes. and we are missing a great, great potential to make them become proper architecture and to provide another scale to the city. Um, and also because having worked uh, lately with, uh, with public projects, for instance, there is always at the end the request to put, I don't know, in a square, in a park, a fountain. Uh, or, or something like a uh, water uh, tap. And, uh, and this request comes always at the end, like uh, you should uh, buy a product no, and put it there and uh, you make a fountain. And, and in this way, I mean, thinking about the water infrastructure, for instance, is a way uh, to, to really uh, have an occasion to provide a different kind of public space. I, I, I'm really intrigued by the role of water in the public space, but not as a decorative element, not as like just beautiful uh, fountains or streams of water to embellish our projects but really as a functional element, no? And as an element to wash your hands, to uh, take a shower, to have a bath and so on. So what we are uh, planning to do is to, to design a conduta and try to realize it uh, in its uh, minimum form in the context of the Porto Academy, in the campus, and, uh, and we'll see uh, where it goes. Amazing. Sounds exciting. <laughs> yeah. To me, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the participants as well, of course. Uh, so, Mateus, uh, Mateo, uh, thank you very much for, for your time, for, for the words. Uh, I'm going to just uh, wrap up here for the, for the audience. Uh, Porto Academy is open uh, to all students and uh, as well as professionals uh, worldwide. And this year it will happen between uh, in July from the 20th to the 27th at the Faculty of Architecture of Porto, uh, designed by Alvaro Cisa, the same as uh, you were speaking of. Uh, the guests of this year are uh, Diogo Aguiar Studio, Saluto Bono, uh, here with us uh, today, Clint Seymour, David Kong, Rafael Cadid, DFDC, Mao Architecture. Becca and Lemon, Walder, Nikish, WOJR, Experience, and Leonard Kadid. Uh, uh, very, very good names. <laughs> uh, the next uh, Instagram Live, the next uh, talk club will, will happen today, uh, featuring DFDC, interviewed by Polini Personeni, uh, and it will happen uh, at 5.30 p.m. Uh, Portugal time. Uh, so that's it. Thanks again, Matteo. Uh, for thanks, for, Pablo. It was, it was a uh, pleasure. yeah, my pleasure. Thanks uh, and enjoy uh, Porto Academy this year. Thank you very much. See you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>